Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Moore. It's a pleasure to go after Larry. Uh, he and I have the same packing skills uh, in, in terms of that. It's also, it's a huge privilege and a pleasure to, uh, you know, address a very large audience of people at a, at a critical milestone in their world that has deep personal and economic significance. I'm talking, of course, to the parents in the audience at this time. But I think you guys, as graduates, also get to participate. And what I want to do, I, I'm from the tech industry. I spend time, um, my life is spent uh, in that world. I wanted to share a few perspectives on what I think is going on in the business world, because the business world itself is going through some pretty dramatic transformations right now. I think they create opportunities uh, for everyone in the room. They also create changes in style and changes in approach that I think we're just coming to grips with. And I want to give you some thoughts about that. And, and the talk is entitled, New World, New Ways, and Your Next 90 Days. So eventually, I kind of want to bring this back to something, kind of an action plan for the next 90 days, uh, just because I think this is a pretty significant 90 days in your life, this, this next 90. But let me kick this off by talking a little bit about the, kind of the new world. You know, so and it's all under the impact of computing for, from, from my perspective. I've been in the tech sector for 40, this is my fourth decade. And each decade has had a kind of a revolution that characterized the decade. So the 80s was a, was a lot about personal computing. And you know, we came into the 80s with a very sort of manual world. And we came out of it with, with, with spreadsheets, with wood processing, with, with presentations. Knowledge work, the character and the texture of knowledge work was dramatically changed by, by what, we, what happened in that, in that decade. And information at your fingertips was sort of the motto that, that Microsoft had coined. And Apple was you know, the computer for the rest of us. And it really did. I mean, personal computing fundamentally changed the way your mind worked and the way you interacted. It didn't have a lot of impact yet on the economics of business. It, was just, it just was kind of more fun. Um, the 90s changed that dramatically. So in the 90s, what happened is all those personal computing applications got hooked up to enterprise applications. And so we had something called client-server architecture, where the PCs were the clients and the back-end data processing systems were the servers. And this, we started creating something called ERP, and all these, these, these global enterprise resource planning systems that could run marketing and sales and manufacturing and engineering across the globe. And halfway through that decade, the internet came online in a pretty dramatic way. So by the end of that decade, what had happened was the face of global commerce had been changed forever. Because we, what we thought was an information transport highway, or an information highway, turned out to be a work transport highway. And the developed economies sent an enormous amount of work into the developing economies, particularly the manufacturing sector sending work to China through those outsourcing agreements, and the services sector sending work to India through those outsourcing agreements. And we took two economies and jump-started them in a way that was unprecedented in the history of the planet. And we now have one of those two economies who's going to be the largest economy in our globe within the foreseeable future. So in terms of foreign aid, that was sort of like the most dramatic change, change of, of, of power and of, and of wealth and of well-being uh, on the planet. It's put, created some challenges for the develop, developed economies, but it's been an amazing impact on the developing economies. Huge. In the last decade, that's kind of settled out. In the last decade, the IT world has changed the consumer experience. So the way we consume media, the way we, we interact with each other, the way we shop, the way, we, go, the way we, we, we do virtually anything in a consumer life, the way we access information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all been dramatically changed. We've become kind of masters of the universe. You can Google anything at any time and get the answer. And you can communicate at any time. For example, like when I graduated in your situation, we didn't have a hashtag for our graduation ceremony. I don't know if any of you are tweeting today, but apparently the hashtag is halt grad if you want to sort of tweet anything to your friends while you're in the middle of this, of this deal. But the whole, that's just a tiny, tiny symptom of you know, the Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon, the world just, it's just the whole consumer experience. You have the little kid on the internet, she's like one year old and she's running her finger over an iPad and then she runs her finger over a magazine and the dad says, this is a magazine that doesn't work. And then it's back to the iPad, this is a magazine that does work. For that child, that's not technology. 
That's the world. That's what she was born into. So it's a whole new world. And this decade, and I want to get back to because this applies to you immediately. This decade, we're going to try to take that set of capabilities and bring them back into the business economy. So what's happened in that, if you think about what does consumerization do to the enterprise? How does it change the work vehicle? I think there's sort of three things that you just put in your mind, and this is the last thing I want to say about New World, but I just kind of want you to have in the back of your mind. So the internet part of the, of the consumerized world, it changes access. So everyone has access all the time, bidirectionally. That was not the way business was ever constructed in the past. Business, business, you had very, very controlled places of access. Access has been essentially, not obliterated, but, but drastically, drastically re-engineered, both inside and outside the enterprise and across multiple enterprises. The second one is broadband. So the consumerization movement taught us is, you know, at the, in the beginning of the last decade, about 2000, the internet was still kind of an intellectual medium. I mean, you entered text, you got stuff back, it was a text-oriented thing. By the time we got through Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram and whatever and YouTube, the internet has become an emotional medium and it's become a world in which you can have a rich emotional experience. I mean, the family exchanges across the internet, the personal exchanges across the internet, some of which are more appropriate than others, but they're, but they're, very, they're very nuanced and so if you bring that back into business, you have to start thinking about, huh, I guess I could conduct fairly significant negotiations without having to fly to be co-located with the person I'm working with, particularly if there's HD you know, uh, video conferencing over the internet in real time kinds of stuff. So that's the second piece. So, so, so access and then emotion. And then this last one is mobile. And so what happened with mobile is that work has now been, has been uh, just kind of unchained from the desktop. And, and so both from the point of view, uh, that's both a positive and a negative, by the way, as, as you will experience, because uh, can, you can't get away from it, but on the other hand, you, you, it's always there if you need it. So that's one piece, and, and also the, the consumer is also always present and accounted in consumer markets, and that's another piece of this mobility. And then the third piece is the mobile device is the on-ramp to the internet for the developing economies. So we've had arguably a billion people on the internet and arguably by the end of the next decade we're going to start getting closer to five because the, the, the cost of the mobile device and the smartphone will get down low enough. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a re-engineering of the entire planet. All of human culture is being re-engineered and the question is how do we re-engineer business practices and business policies? And you're, you're going to land right in the middle of that and the people that, you are, that, that are running the organizations that you're going to report into if you, go to a, if you don't found your own company, if you go to an existing organization, do not know the answers to these questions. And they'll probably hope that you can give them a clue. And you won't know them either, but you're young enough to pretend you do. And so it'll, it'll work. Just, just be authoritative and they'll, oh, yeah, there's a young person, millennial, yeah, yeah, do whatever they say, yeah, just do that. So what is going to happen? Let's, let, let's see if we just can't, I just want to kind of push this a little bit further ahead. So what's happening for the enterprise is space and time have just kind of gotten uh, each warped, a little bit Einstein moment. So the bounds of space have actually been loosened. You can now locate work pretty much wherever you want to locate work. You can also, at the margin, locate workers pretty much where you want to. When, in, in, you know, in my father's day, when you came to work, you went to a very specific building in a very specific city. So in my life, I've probably gone to work at least half of my days in seat 1B in United Airlines, okay? But it's still a, a seat in a, in a place. But now it's like, Work is a place, you don't go to work, you are at work. So it's not going to work, it's being at work. And if you have young children, you will have this experience where their children will come up to you and they say, can we play? No, I'm at work. Well, you're on the couch, Dad, and you usually watch football here. Yeah, yeah I know, but now I'm at work, right? And it's a mental state. So, so, so that's, that's kind of going on. That's going to have, um, uh, that's one bound. The other bound is time. So space got a lot freer. Time got a lot more constrained. And when, when, when I went into business, we sent letters to, to people. I, it's, a, it's a form of communication that, it, from an ancient era. But we sent letters to people, and the deal was, if you got back to them in a few days, maybe a week, that was good. That was, yeah, that was a good, timely response. Because so then you went to email, well, not a, a week, e come on, but a day, maybe a day and a half, maybe a second day for email. Now you're texting, 
It's been 30 minutes. What, what you're not talking to me? Okay, so, 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 so we're watching the cycle time of time get incredibly compressed, and it's happening across entire business value chains. So it used to be six weeks or five, well, start with the automobile industry, which had a five-year design cycle. Okay? And you start saying, well, come on, we've got to take that down. Then you start thinking about six weeks to do this, or eight weeks to do that, or 12 weeks, or 14 or 16 weeks. It's going, what are you talking about? You know, I need it Tuesday. And so all of a sudden, the cycle time of business has gotten very, very competitive, which means information systems about just in time, just in place, that kind of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff going on there, all relatively new technology that people are trying to absorb. And so the net of that is, I think we're virtualizing work. Work can happen kind of anywhere, anytime, any place. And the game has got to be, you must be present in the moment so that time matters, but the place does not matter because these facilities will let you be present in the moment kind of anywhere on the planet. But now go back to the interesting transition where you are right now. So the idea is you graduate from a place like Holt, you should, you would like to say, I'm moving into a very established role someplace in the world. In my era, the idea was you were going to start your career path. You're supposed to get a job and enter this thing. And in, in that era, it was an era of hierarchical organizations who worked in a particular building. I'm going to go to work at 24, 98 Battery Street, and I'm going to be, you know, working for a company that has, you know, 350 people in that building, and I'm going to be one of them, kind of thing. And they would come out and recruit people from classes like yours, and you, you'd, go, you'd go to work in that business. Not so much. The world has changed from supervised, hierarchical, co-located organizations to much more of this network of entrepreneurial agents who may be under contract, may be employed, but they're agents. You're expected to, you're not expected to supervise, you're expected to do. And you're expected to negotiate across a value chain, not run an operation in your department on your floor with the people that, that you can walk around and say hello to. So all of a sudden, this, this metaphor of the agent entrepreneur is a much stronger part of, of, of business, particularly people who have graduate degrees, than the old, you're a supervising manager. And, and, and instead of having people come out and recruit you into the firm, you're now kind of expected to find your place in the world kind of on your own, which is not very fair because you're competing against people that may be a lot more experienced, who have a lot more, more entrees than you do, but that's kind of the world you've been, that's the hand you've been dealt. People are not onboarding you the way they did, certainly not the way they did in my father's organization a day, and not in the way that it was happening in my day. People are not reaching out to you and sort of kind of parent to child, kind of bringing you along. This is much more of an adult-adult game from, from scratch. So your first thought might be, well, gee, that's, that's, that's tough. And it is. I would argue getting your first job, getting into the system, is a very, very, it's much harder to do that today than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago going forward. The reward on the other side of that is once you get in, the opportunity space is much, much broader. The opportunity to have an impact happens much earlier in your career than it would otherwise. And the financial rewards and personal rewards, frankly, are much higher. So I think on the, on the whole, I would make that trade but it, makes, it puts a lot of pressure on your next 90 days. Assuming your next 90 days is, this is when I've got to make that transition. So I want to close by thinking about your next 90 days from two points of view. And I think either one of these, these are two paths forward. I think both are totally legitimate. At various times in my life, I've taken both paths. And, and, and I want to kind of just put them in front of you, and I want you to think about how, which path you're on and which game you're going to play in the next 90 days, because I would encourage you to put yourself on a 90-day plan. The first 90-day plan is called just get a job, okay? Just, just get a job, okay? The, 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 when, you, when you're on that one, it's a very pragmatic plan. It says, by the way, you know, I have some debt, I have some income, I, 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 I need to make a living. What you do is you you, 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 first of all, you activate your network, what Larry was talking about. There are people who are invested in you. They care about you. You activate that network. You, you look for any opportunities. You turn over rocks, and you start reshaping your resume to fit the job. So I could be a product manager for the music company, 
or I could be an educational specialist at a, a chemical company. Or, and you, you're pulling from your resume randomly, you know, to say, I had leadership, I showed skill. You know, you, you, basically, you're lying, but, but, you're, but, you're, but, but, but you're putting together a picture of yourself which says, I can slide into the system. And the idea behind that strategy is just get on the other side of that membrane. Just get on the other side. The first job you get will be the wrong job. But it won't matter because after 6 to 12 to 18 to 24 months, you can move around. It'll work. It'll work. When I was 32 years old, I was a professor of English, and we decided to move back to California, and there were no jobs in my profession. So I joined a software company as an educational specialist. That was the first series of lies. But eventually went through a series of jobs, but it wasn't until eight years later that I actually became a marketing consultant, which turned out to be what I was supposed to do, and it's worked out very well. But it took eight years uh, to get there. That was eight interesting years, and I was learning all the way along the line. But I didn't start. Where I started was nowhere close to where I ended. And, and, and needless to say, having a doctorate in medieval English literature wasn't exactly the entree for a software firm. But, but it, okay, but, but you got, I got in. I got in, and once you got in, you, you could kind of move around. So that's, that's, sort of, that's for more of the kind of the pragmatic, the, if you have that kind of personal style. Kind of just land someplace, go someplace. The other one is, well, that's not me. And by the way, I don't have a job. And I'm, I'm kind of anxious that I may not have a job in 90 days. So I've been thinking about this because if you look at, at the earnings potential of someone, the sooner you enter the workforce, that's the, the when you enter the workforce in, in the career you're going to do, is, is, is the biggest determinant of your total lifetime earning. So if I don't have a job, if, if I were in your shoes, I'm going to take Larry's thing, I'm going to, oh, by the way, don't switch shoes when you come up here. Wear, wear your own shoes when you come up here. But, but, but if I'm going to put myself in the shoes of someone who says, I don't have a job. And this is plan number two. So if you don't have a job, start your career today. So what does that mean? That means, okay, I'm a company of one. I have no clients. By the way, my first job will be my first client. But I don't have a I mean, you can call your boss your client. But I don't have any clients. But I know what I want to do. I, I, have a, I believe in what I want to do. I believe in being service, in service to something. I want to do that. So you've just been trained for the last year. Make a marketing plan for yourself. Who's your target market? What's your value proposition? What are your crown jewels? How are you going to bring that to market? Then the next thing is identify the institutions in the world that you want to work at. And then work there. I mean, just immediately go there. First of all, go there and say, look, I, you have any openings? No, we don't have any openings. I need to do this kind of work. Can I volunteer? Can I intern? Can I, do you, is there, I mean, literally, you, you go to where you want to be and you just find a way to start working and don't worry about the compensation. We actually, this is how we built all the great internet companies, by the way, the last 10 years. Uh, because for, Google had no business model, right? Facebook had no business model. It was just like, just do it. And we called it the, the URL, which I think literally stands for like uniform record locator. URL came to stand for ubiquity now, revenue later. And what, I, what it was about was building equity with a community and then transforming that equity at a later state into monetization. You, there is no reason why you cannot build equity now by doing the things you love now. And, and if you do that, if you kind of put yourself in service to something worthy of you and, and something that you believe in and that the, world, you know, that the world believes in, then my experience is when you do what the world wants you to do, what the world thinks you're meant to do, and what you think you're meant to do, the world will find a way to reward you. So I wish you good luck on your journey, and congratulations on your achievement today.